Eric Jack. Second is 12. All on 18. Third and eight. In the play. Fourth and eight. First and ten ball on 41. OD 41. Deonkis Nelson on the tenth point after Kendrick Jackson. He can do it. The point is good. Second is five. Short five, maybe. Ah, hold on, Maurice. Third and four. Time out. Time out on the field. Call by. Third and four. Pass complete to Donald Clark, number seven. First and ten, OG 49. Second and six. Third and six. Don't do the lay of the game. Ten stall. Third and about eleven. Passing two. Kendrick Jackson. Fourth and eleven. Third formation. Incomplete. 
second and ten. Third and long nine. Fumble, fumble, fumble. Okay, fumble on the play, Oak Grove recovers the ball on the Oak Grove 45. First and 10, ball on 45, on B45. Incomplete. Second and 10. That's down on the play that's the draft of the extra point. Do it. Tensile zero. There's number six, Edward Williams. Ball on 10 south, 22. Okay, there he is. Incomplete. Take second and 10. Third and eleven. Oh, Maurice! Maurice! Received near the over 45, number 22, Kendrick Jackson. Fourth and long three. Ten balls on the ten saw nineteen. First and go, balls on the five. Coil. 
Time out. Ten south. Third and twelve. There you go, Moblin. Cephas. I have to think fourth and toy. Victor received the punt for Oak Grove of the Tensaw 45. 22, Kendrick Jackson. Fourth and 
ten. Punk formation. Quarterback in the game for the Tigers, Tiger number 27. Okay, second and nine. Oh! Pass is incomplete. Third and nine. Pass complete to 31. Jacob. Five for the extra point. Oh, no good. Extra point at zero. One hey, four, uh, 34 to nothing. C for Timsaw. First and ten, ten twelve twenty. Second and ten. Number 17. 
first and ten ball on the 39, OG 39. Second and a long six. Okay, third and eleven. Fourth and eleven. Not formation. First and ten, ball on ten saw thirty-eight. Second and five. First and ten, ball on OG forty-seven. Second and seven. Pass. Third and seven. Pass was incomplete on the last play. Fourth and twelve, or short twelve. First and ten, ball on OG twenty six. Second and ten. Start of the fourth quarter. Brokerage and appraisals. Start line. Second and eleven. Number three, Tyler Sanders on the interception for the Tigers. Then it said first and ten, OT on the OG ten. Second and six. Oh, 
third and five. Penalties all five, ten fouls. Third and less than a yard. Eight fifty seven left. First down, ball on the 25 and a half. Ball start Oak Road, uh, first and 15. Second and 16. Third and about 17 or so. Fourth and about four, uh, 14. Punch. Okay, first and 10 balls on about the OG 41. Okay. Second and one. Illegal motion, I think. Okay, first, first and 10. 10 from the 16 yard line of the Tigers. Second and one. North one. Here at Tiger Stadium next Friday night for the first round playoff game. One forty four left, first fourth quarter. Okay, second and go. Third and goal, ball's on the two. 44 seconds left in the game. Uh-oh. Fourth and goal, ball's on the inside the one. 10 seconds left. the end of the ball game with your final score, Oak Grove 41, Tinsaw 6. Once again, reminder, Tiger fans, the Oak Grove Tigers will be hosting. Come out and support your Oak Grove Tigers. End of the game. Final score, 41 to 6. singing. Oh, come on. <laughs> Y'all thought you were in for a surprise, didn't you? Thank you so much, David. Beautiful song, beautifully done. First Kings 18 is our scripture today. That's on page 341 if you're using the Pew Bible. Page 341, First Kings 18. One of my favorite Old Testament characters is a man by the name of Elijah. He makes me think of Paul in lots of ways in the New Testament because you'll remember that Paul, it seemed like everywhere he went, he caused a stir. In fact, someone said once that one of two things happened whenever Paul came on the scene, either a great revival or a revolution. And it was sort of like that with Elijah, a great, great prophet, a great man of God. But a man not unlike us, and Paul had this same, scenario, this same uh, persona in that there were times when he was 
on the mountain peak of being bold and courageous and, and uh, straightforward. But then there were times when he was rather timid and shy and felt like he'd been forsaken. So we can identify with both Paul and Elijah in that sense. A gutsy and different, uh, even an odd kind of person, this man Elijah. Well, by the time we come to the story in chapter 18 of 1 Kings, three and one half years have passed, during which time there's been no rain. And during which time Paul, uh, Paul not Paul, but Elijah, had been on the run from Ahab, the king of Israel. Worse than that, his wife Jezebel, they had his number. They were out to get him. They despised him because he called a spade a spade. And he, didn't, he had not made the best of friends with the king of Israel, Ahab, and his wife Jezebel. Three and one half years had passed. No rain had fallen in response to Elijah's prayer to God, God showing his power and his might uh, in response to Elijah's prayers. And then he draws to Mount Carmel a great host of people from Israel. And in that number were 400 prophets of Baal, a false god, and 450 more prophets of Ashtoreth, another false god. So here is a great number of 850 false prophets pitted against in a contest of sorts against one prophet whose name is Elijah, the prophet of Jehovah God. And when he challenged them, they just ate up the idea because they saw their great host, their great number, and they believed that their gods would answer and would, would help them through whatever contest they would be challenged to deal with. And then they looked over at this one measly little man named Elijah. And so I can just hear them saying to one another, boys, let's have some fun. Let's show this man really uh, how the cow eat the cabbage, as my grandmother used to say. Let's really show him up. Let's accept his challenge and, and en engage in this contest that he's proposing. And let's show him who's really the stronger, whether Baal or Jehovah God. Well, they began to cry out to Baal and to Ashtoreth, the gods of lightning and fire. They used one tactic and then another. They cajoled and they screamed and they pled, trying to get the attention of Baal. But nothing happened. The sky was without a cloud and there was no, uh, nothing going on and no response from this false god, Baal, regardless of these hundreds of prophets, in sincerity and in earnest, calling out and begging out that their God make his presence and his power known. Elijah kidded them. He said after a while of all this business, he said, maybe your God is on a trip or maybe your God is asleep. Maybe you need to cry a little louder. Well, this really fired them up even the more. So they leapt up on top of the altar and they began to scream even the louder and they began to cut themselves so that blood ran from their arms, thinking that surely their God, upon seeing this degree of intense earnest, earnestness and sincerity, would respond and do something. But nothing, nothing happened. In spite of all the activity, all the sincerity, all the numbers of them as they were so great in number, nothing happened. Let's stop there for just a moment and see some parallels between that setting, that scene, and the scene in many of today's churches. There are many, many churches today where nothing is happening. It's not that they're lacking in fervor or activity or in sincerity. Their calendars may be full with all kinds of conferences and meetings and committees and scheduled events. It may be that they're making lots of noise and that through the years they've come to believe that busyness is synonymous with commitment. It may be that in spite of all of this, there still is no fire. We look around into the sky, we look around ourselves, among ourselves, into our hearts, into our midst, into our organization, and we ask, where is the fire? And all we get is the deafening silence. It's not because we're not trying. In many instances, churches are busy. They are filled with programs and promotions and meetings and budgets and committees and conferences. But all of that has failed to produce the fire from heaven that we need more than anything else. In some cases, the leaders are frantically trying to produce a few sparks. And the average church member, like the average guy on the street, is looking from afar and asking and wondering, not he, the church member would never say the words, but deep within his heart, he's asking, maybe the preacher's not right when he says that God is a God of power. 
That God is a God who moves and shakes things and people and changes people's hearts and transforms circumstances and situations. Is God really who he says that he is? If so, then where are, is the power? And where is the happening? Where is the activity that will be heaven sent, that will make a difference in our lives? Well, back to the story here in chapter 18 of 1 Kings. Onto center stage walks a lone figure whose name, as we've said already, is Elijah, a prophet, a man of God. He gathers the people around. Now, he is no stranger to these people. They know him for the message that he's been preaching, a message that more often than not is abrasive and harsh, that cuts across the grain, that makes them uncomfortable, that rattles their cages of the comfort zone that they found themselves to settle into time and time again. And he gives them a challenge, and that challenge is get off the fence. Make up your minds once and for all who is really God. Is it Baal whom you worshiped and whom all these prophets are serving all these many years? Or is it Jehovah God? Jehovah God, he declared to them, is one God. He has declared he is jealous of his people embracing other gods along with the time, same time trying to embrace him and be, be pledged to him. And as he gives this challenge, he says, let's find out once and for all today, right here on the top of this mountain, who the real God is. And whoever wins, let the other side say, we agree and we will fall in line with you and we will worship the true God who proves himself to be true on this day. So he directs their attention to the altar of Jehovah God, Elijah does. The other bunch has had their chance and they failed. In spite of all their screaming and cajoling and all their, their antics, they have failed. But he says, it's my turn now, fellas, so look to the altar of Jehovah. He brings 12 stones, one each for the 12 tribes of Israel, or the sons of Jacob, and puts them there. He has the animal, the bull brought in. It's cut up and it's put on the top of the stones, as was the custom of sacrifice making in those days. And then he shocks them by saying, bring water and pour the water on the altar. Now, they didn't believe that he was serious at first, but he insisted. So they said, well, we've failed, so let's try what he's asking and what he's recommending. So they bring four barrels full of water, pour all of that water on the, on the sacrifice, the meat and the stones and, and the wood until it's just soaked through and through. But see, he's not satisfied, Elijah's not. Bring four more barrels of water of like sort, he says, and pour that water on the altar too. Dig a trench around the altar. Let the trench, the little ditch, all around the, the, the altar be filled with water. They thought he was crazy, but they did what he suggested. And then for a third time, he said, bring yet four more barrels full of water and pour it on the altar too. Now keep in mind, three and a half years it hadn't rained, and I suppose, I suppose that some of the water at least that they were using to pour unnecessarily and, and senselessly, they thought, on this altar was quite a waste. And they probably, some of them were thinking, well, there goes our last drop of water. We're all going to die from thirst because it's no rain in sight and here we are going through this thirst. But still they did it just exactly as he said. And then after that third time of three of four barrels of water, each of those times put on the altar and in the trench all around, he did not engage in the antics and the gyrations that the others had earlier. No magic tricks, no matches, no kerosene. But he said a simple prayer. And that's found in chapter 18, verse 36 of 1 Kings. It came to pass at the time of the offering and the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I, that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast, not, that thou hast turned their, back, uh, their heart back again. And then look and see what happens. Just a simple prayer, but one prayed from the heart. We don't have to scream and we don't have to cut ourselves to get God's attention. He's attentive more than we are to him. We simply pray a very lowly, breathed prayer, whispered prayer. God hears even our thoughts of prayer. God hears and understands. But here in this instance, we read in verse 38, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice 
and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And then see what the result of it was in verse 39. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God. Hot, real fire, consuming fire. What is the fire of God? We've talked about that today. We'll talk some more about it. What is the fire of God? When a preacher talks about the fire of God falling upon a church in a revival time or upon an individual life who really turns his life around and, and begins to live for God, what is the fire of God? The fire of God is the power of God. It's the presence of God. It's the glory of God. And friend, that's the greatest need in our churches today for the fire of heaven to fall upon us and to awaken us and consume our sins and to turn us around. That's what we need today. We have felt needs, as psychologists talk about. These Israelites thought their need was water, and they did need water. But they focused so on that that they, realized, they failed to realize that beyond that was a greater need a need that could not be tasted with the tip of the tongue, that could not be handled with the hands. The great need of all was fire from God, a revitalization of their own faith in God, the true God, the true Lord God Jehovah. That's the great need of then and the great need of today. I'm talking about the manifest power and glory of God. I'm talking about in our services more than having nice singing and a nice service and nice preaching. I'm talking about results that cannot, be, that, that cannot be manipulated or orchestrated or calculated. And when the results come and things happen, all we can say is just shake our heads and say, God did it. Preacher didn't do it. The song didn't do it. We're not good enough for God to do it. God did it. God sent his fire. God sent his revival. It's he that's done what's been done. I'm talking about something more than the ordinary operation of the Holy Spirit in the lives of a few, and I'm talking about the fire of God falling upon the masses of people as it did in this story in 1 Kings. Well, what does the fire do? When God's fire falls, what does it do? It makes us see God for who He really is. We all have all kinds of ideas as to whom God is. Some people even will say, well, it's almost like there are two gods. You read in the Old Testament about a God that is just and that is vengeful and that, uh, that gives instructions in some cases to his army to go into a city and wipe out everybody there, including the little women and the little children. And, and they, they think of God in the Old Testament as being a vengeful, mean, cruel kind of God. And then they go to the New Testament and they say, well, the God there is a God of love and a God of joy and a God that, that assures us and comforts us. But friend, there's just one God. That was the very thing that Elijah had to confront and deal with here in this, in this story before us. And he is both and. We see not only in the Old Testament, but even in the book of Revelation, John on the Isle of Patmos given, given, given a view into heaven's throne room and he sees there and hears there the thunderings and the lightnings of a holy and just God. So it's like two sides of the hand. There are two sides. God is holy. God is just. God is judgmental. He judges us. He judges sin, but he also loves us, and he comforts us, and he gives us his joy. Today, some people think of God as a grandfather type, rocking in his rocking chair and pushing buttons and passively tolerating and winking at sin in the world and in the church. But friend, that's not the way I conceive of God, and certainly not the way that the, the Bible presents God as being. When God shows up, when God shows up, people as a rule are made uncomfortable. You look at your life, I'll look at mine. We all get our own little rut and we settle in and we, we make our nest and we're comfortable there. And sometimes when a preacher preaches a sermon like Elijah did or John the Baptist did or like Jesus did or Paul or Peter or Timothy, it's not very comfortable. Some preachers I know say, don't tell me you enjoyed that sermon because if you enjoyed the sermon, that means I didn't do my job. Well, I'm not that, that extreme because I know what people are talking about when they say they enjoy the sermon. But for the most part, when God shows up, we don't enjoy it. Like going home from school or going home and, and facing the music for some misdeed we've done and, and mama and daddy's on our case and we know we've got, uh, you know what to pay because of our ill deed. God is that kind of God. He's a father God. He's a God who disciplines, who chastises, who chastens because he loves us. 
Usually when God shows up, it's not comfortable. John the Apostle on the Isle of Patmos, when he saw the, God, the, the Lord and the, the visions that God gave him, he was terrorized at the visions that God showed him. In the book of Isaiah, the seraph and the angels had to cover their faces when the glory and the presence of God made itself known. It's an overwhelming view of God, God's holiness and God's glory that we, we're talking about. Friend, how long has it been since you saw God? Well, the Bible says someone would answer that no man has seen God at any time. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how long has it been since you have been in the presence of the glory of God that you've been so overwhelmed by it. As you've seen, as you've seen and recognized His holiness and by way of contrast as you've come to realize in a new kind of way your own sense of unworthiness. So much that you're overcome by it all. How long has it been since that happened? When the fire falls, here's what's going to happen. When the fire of God falls, it's going to consume everything that is unholy and earthly and temporal, everything about our lives. When the fire of God falls, it's going to purify and melt and purge and devour. Just like Hebrews 12, 29 reads, our God is a consuming fire. When the fire of God falls, it's going to be like a refiner's fire, spoken of in Malachi 3, verse 3. A refiner being that of causing all the impurities as the heat is applied to rise to the surface and be exposed for what they are. When God's fire falls, sin is judged and dealt with thoroughly by him who knows everything and him, him, him who has the final word in judgment. Not just the open, public, obvious sins, but the secret, hidden sins of the human heart. When God's fire falls, the masks of respectability are pulled off and pretense is stripped away, and the souls of men are laid bare before the gaze of an all-seeing and all-knowing God. When God's fire falls, there is deep heart conviction and grief over sin. When God's fire falls, there is an intense searchlight of God's holiness, making things that were unacceptable to us just a bit, a bit, a short time ago prove to be so detestable and so abhorrent. When God's, fall, God's fire falls, indifference is turned into mourning. When God's fire falls, a casual attitude towards sin is replaced by an attitude of brokenness and repentance. When God's fire falls, the efforts of men, believers, is, are tested. Much of what we hold up as being authentic spiritual activities are exposed for what they really are, mere human effort, and they are turned into wood and hay and stubble and do not survive the test of the fire. When God's fire falls, our traditional methods and programs are yielded up to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and there is a freshness of life and a purity and even a sense of spontaneity that we never knew before when the fire of God falls. Where is that fire? I wish I could bottle it and sell it. Where is that fire, preacher, you're talking about? Where is it? Is it anywhere in Northeast Louisiana? Is it anywhere in West Carroll Parish? Is it in any Sunday school class in First Baptist Church, Oak Grove? Is it in any heart of any believer, any mom or dad or church leader or teenager in First Baptist Church, Oak Grove? Where is it? Where is the evidence of his power and his presence? Where is the sense of awe and wonder and fear? Where are the tears of brokenness and contrition? Where are lost people falling down on their faces, crying out to a loving, holy God for mercy? as they seek his salvation. Where is a church or a people that is known for having a fire of God? Four reasons we don't have the fire. Reason number one, we don't think we need it. We're content to live without it. Lots of us feel like at a time like this when a sermon like this is presented and when God's word is presented in the fashion as we hope it is today, not by man but by his spirit, we feel like putting up an out, on the outside of our heart's door a sign that says, do not disturb. Preacher, do not disturb me. I'm content with where I am and with what I am. Don't rattle in my cage, preacher. I'm comfortable where I am. It's not the preacher doing it. If it happens, it's the Word of God and the Spirit of God doing it. I'm just an instrument, just a tool that hopefully he's going to use in speaking to all of us present here today and those listening by radio as well that we've been so, so long contented where we are and with what we are, that we don't see anything better, anything down the road beyond where we already have come. And that brings on a sense of staleness and a sense of, of, of complacency and even indifference. And God looks at us and he just shakes our heads. 
And the preachers and others twist our arms and beg and plead and, and, and have a hard, hard time, harder every year to get people willing to serve and, and to be ministers and to help move the church of God through the years and through the community. As we look at this, let's ask, why is it that we don't need, don't sense the need? We said a while ago that the Israelites thought they needed water. That was their felt need. But once the fire came, the water came, the rain came. For the most part, as a nation, as a church, as homes, as individual lives, we're empty. We're running on empty. We look at our gas gauge, we're on empty, and we're about to run out of steam and be stranded on the roadside when it comes to the power and the presence and the fervor of God that he wants so much to put in our lives. What we think we need versus what God knows that we need. We think we need more money, more buildings, a better staff, more equipment. We don't see our real need, and because of that, God has been disappointed with our sin of failing to see what he wants for us and replacing that with what we think we want for us. And because of that, God has withdrawn his glory and his power from us, not because he wanted to, but because we forced him into it. We forced his hand. Our eyes.